Cabin Sports Radio. Here comes the siren. I want to go higher. Oh, my goodness. Oh, a very special episode of Cabin Sports Radio. We are live in Studio One for the first time in God knows how long. Four months? At least. That's been a while. The better part of four months. Early mid-March. Lecter, Mike Gibbons, in the Cabin Radio Studios with you for another episode of Cabin Sports Radio and a glorious one it shall be. Mike, you're out of isolation. How does that feel? Great. I'm a free bird. <laughs> great, yeah, it's great. Just back in the <laughs> studio. It's been it's been far too long. How does it look in here, dude? It's a little different. Yeah, yeah. the decor yeah, is a decor. little more. Um, You're always stepping up your swag game. A little more symmetrical oh, yeah. than you probably remember. It looks great. I don't know if you knew, but we had a new wall put in back here wow. behind us, and uh, so AJ had to take down all the stuff. Yep, and it was just a mess before. And you know AJ, GM AJ of Cabin Radio. Yeah, yeah. You can't you can't have two lines that are crooked no. from one another. Not even in a in a studio that was just kind of decorated by the seat of our pants. Right. No, everything had to be redecorated, but it looks nice. He's, it a, looks really he's a handyman. He's a handyman. He did a good job. I tip my cap. I'll have yeah. to say that in person next time. But yes. no, it looks good. It's looking good in here. Yeah. I'm very happy to be back. And we are happy to have you back, Thank sir. You. Like Thank I you. said, I did not want to hear your voice again. Yeah. If I couldn't see your face. Yeah. We got by. Your face. We got by. We got but by. it was different. That's it right. was definitely different. Yeah. But here we are. Cabin Sports Radio. Lots to talk about today. Uh, pretty big news in the NHL. Uh, pretty big news out of the MLB. NBA is getting set to start their playoffs. Lots is happening. And f- appropriate time for us to be live again for the first time in, once again, God knows how long. But let's recap it all with a look at the CSR headlines. Did this sound as glorious? It sounds so much better now. I know, yeah. right? Right. Oh, in person. Nothing like it. The intro, too. Ooh. Take it away, Mike. All right, we're going to start with the NHL. The National Hockey League announced the name of its 32nd franchise last week. The league's newest team, the Seattle Kraken, also unveiled their team logo and jerseys on Thursday. Seattle will play in the league's Pacific Division starting in the 2021-2022 season. Their addition will give the NHL an even 16 teams in each conference. All right, now everyone loves balance. Like now's that. your chance to yeah. give us your best Liam Neeson impression. Release the Kraken! Release the Kraken! They they're going to have them on their payroll. I they know have it. To. It's it, like there's going to be. So I was just thinking of it when we were you know getting all set up in studio. Now the last venue I attended was in Las Vegas. Uh, oh yeah, before yeah. the COVID, right? Right. Uh, yeah. We were there shortly in uh, the new year. Uh, we spent New Year's in Ontario, but then quickly went over to Vegas for a right. four-night stay. Amazing time. We saw a Knights game. It was a great game, by the way. They played the Blues. Oh, yeah. Not division rival. They're central. But it was a great game. Lots of St. Louis fans there, too, all over town. Great atmosphere. Um, you know, middle of the season, but things were ramping up a little bit. Right. And I just it sort of brought me back to... Oh, that was the last time I was in a professional sporting arena, right? Yeah. Uh, and the atmosphere they do, they put on, you know, Vegas. They're oh, all yeah. about the theatrics, right? It is a oh, full blown yeah. production. They've got the night, they've got the, you know, the drone flying around this big ball. They've got the guys, uh, you know, sword fighting in the ice. They've got yep. the castle up top. Really extra, really, really extra. <laughs> um, but I think. You know, with a new team like this, there's so much excitement yeah. around a new team. Mm. They can they can have all the creative fun in the world that they want. Um, but yes, I, immediately the gifts started pouring in. All the memes started coming in. And uh, Liam Neeson turning to the camera and saying, release the Kraken. Like, they have to enter when they're announcing their team as the home team in Seattle for the first time. They have to do that. I'm sure oh, they will. Absolutely. And you want to get the crowd a little fired up, you oh, know, yeah. during a, you know, uh, inter, you know, intermission or Count that down type to of thing. puck drop. Oh, oh man, it's yeah. gonna be off the hook. Um, and a lot of people 
uh, sharing their their thoughts on the new team yes. name, the new team crest. They unveiled the the branding, the jerseys, yep. everything about it. Uh, what did you think? I was really happy. Uh, I know. So this for me, uh, you know, just be- with everything that's going on with with COVID nineteen and where the leagues are at in terms of. Uh, either uh, resuming play or, you know, the N- MLB uh, starting a fresh new season. Right. It kind of got lost in the shuffle a little bit for me. And then, you know, Thursday, looking at the timelines, like, whoa, that's awesome. Yeah. We all, we, we, we knew that Seattle was going to be the, the league's 32nd team. Uh, the last expansion team, of course, being the Vegas Golden Knights. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have an expansion draft now to look forward to after, yeah. I guess, after next season. That will be fun. And there will be a lot of speculation in the season ahead in terms of who teams are going to lock up. Um, but yeah, I remember we had a previous show where we were throwing around some names of, of our own. Uh, I, I was a big fan. I like the Kraken. Yeah. I like that they're sort of paying homage to... Seattle's a great city, a great mm-hmm. sports city. They've, of course, got the Seahawks. Um, they've got the Mariners. They lost the Supersonics, which right. was a, or a pretty big blow to them when they went to uh, OKC. Mm-hmm. Um so a very deserving, very good sports city. I'm sure they'll form a pretty quick rivalry with Vancouver, which will be great. Uh, we get balance now. So uh, I think Arizona is now going to move over to the Central, which makes sense. Um, so now... What Why are, we- are they still here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we got eight teams in each division now. We got 16 teams in each conference. I love the logo. I love that they sort of are paying homage to, you know, their... Uh, a sea, uh, sea bound, uh, seaboard, sea. Yeah, they're they're right on the ocean, right? So yeah. they, the Kraken. I love it. I yeah. like the colors. I like the the jerseys. I like the logo. Uh, I did hear, you know, a couple complaints here and there that they, you know could have made made it look a little more Krakeny. I, it kind of actually reminded me of the uh, the Mariners logo. It's fairly similar. You got the right. big the big S. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's got that little red dot in the middle of the Kraken's eye. You know, yeah. so. Uh, I was a big fan. I was really happy, um, and uh, no, all around. I think from a branding point of view, it, it's going to look pretty good. Yeah, like the colors. I'm pretty excited for for hockey to make its way back. I guess to uh, to Seattle. Yeah, it's it's been a while. It's, it's been, been a, a long yeah, it's time been a coming. Minute. It's been a minute. Uh, I I like what you said though about yeah. It's like we almost kind of forgot about it because yeah, yeah. like I I don't think aside from hockey fans in Seattle and you know perhaps like Vancouver because it's right there. Yeah, I don't think this was really on anyone's schedule or radar. No. There's just been you know in the last four months so much confusion yep. and trying to figure out where we're going and you know how to for the NHL specifically how to save a season that was already in the midst yeah. you know hanging in the balance i don't think anyone yeah i think most of us legitimately kind of forgot that that was even an upcoming yeah. announcement right. you know and so yeah like you when it got announced it was kind of like oh were, were other people expecting this because yeah. this feels really out of the blue to yeah. me um but overall i mean it was a, it was definitely a nice uh nice change of pace from other things we had been talking about right especially regarding pro sports team names you know, yeah, something right? a little yeah. bit positive. A good news story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nobody upset, aside from you know maybe people who weren't hot on the name Kraken. But I think like personally compared to, uh, I just off the top of my head, some of the other team names right. that were being bandied about were uh, Seattle Evergreens. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Seattle Sockeyes was one. There was a couple more that were, you know, were kind of so-so. I wasn't crazy about right. it. I remember, like you said, though, when we were talking about it in the past, though, Kraken was one of the original, uh, one of the ones that was out there. As, yeah, you know, short a poten- yeah, yeah, shortlist team name. That's the word I'm looking yeah, thank for. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, and I liked it right off the bat. I thought that would be a really cool team name to go with. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad they went with it. I think it's the coolest sounding, it's the right. most dangerous sounding mythological creature. Like, yeah. why not, right? Um. Yeah. Love. Just right there with you with uh with the jersey. Love the colors. They make a lot of sense mm-hmm. for Seattle. Uh. You know. It's it's sports history. They're kind of akin to like the Mariners. They're kind of similar to the Seahawks without that that crazy loud green color that they right, have in there, right. which I'm fine with not having. Uh. And the logo. Yeah. I love. I think it's Big great. Fan. It's uh, it's simple. You got you know just little kind of things and like the little red eye yep. in there. It just it nails the point home without without venturing into any kind of gaudy mm. territory. Because yeah, I mean you could make it look a bit more krakeny, right? You know, tentacles flying every yeah, which way. Yeah. But I mean we don't we don't need that. We already just we talked about the the Vegas Golden Knights. 
they've got gaudy covered yeah, in the NHL. They're pretty extra. Yeah, we didn't need any more of that. So congratulations to uh, to the group bringing the Seattle Kraken. And uh, yeah, very much looking forward to uh, to their first season. And if the expansion draft is anything like Las Vegas got, uh-huh. they might have a pretty good team on their hands. They'll do okay. Yeah. Stanley Cup finals run in their first season. Can we go out and predict that now? I, I think we should. And then yeah, run into not? Ovi and, and he gets his first cup, which was a great story. <laughs> but obviously, yeah, no, the Vegas Golden Knights had a fantastic uh, inaugural season. Yeah. In this era, if you're an expansion franchise and you're not making a cup run in your first season, yeah. what do you do? Yeah, they they set the bar so high now because <laughs> for the seriously for the longest time, you know, ex- you would just expect expansion teams to be bottom dollar, bottom yeah. feeders for yeah. for years at a time until yep. you maybe establish somewhat of a young core, get yeah. a couple draft picks here and there, get a veteran who wants to commit, build around that. Um, but they right out of the gates. Um, and yeah, there was a lot of excitement. I think it's, you know, you get these mid tier, you know, they basically got an entire team of second liners or, yeah, and, and obviously Mark Andre Fleury, who everyone yeah. knew even two years in advance, um, when Pittsburgh was sort of making a shift in the crease, obviously committed to, to Matt Murray. Um, the writing was on the wall for even yeah. a couple seasons at a time. And then of course it, it happened. And my goodness, he's been absolutely amazing. Um, for the, the Vegas Golden Knights. I'm sure we'll get to them later when we do our tee-up. Probably one of the teams that could go just as deep again this year. Why not? Um, so that's what you can do with uh, in this era with uh, with expansion drafts. But yeah, really, really exciting news. A really good sports town. I'm sure there'll be some fun Pacific Division rivalries now. Vancouver mm-hmm. in very close proximity. Yep. Uh, you know, even when um, there like are the Mariners California games. California coast there. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Even Mariners games, you'll see tons of Canadians uh, across the border if they're playing the Blue Jays. It, it looks like a home game, basically. So probably be, well, not for the time being anyways, with the border being closed. And, uh, well, being in two different hub cities. But we're talking, of course, about the 2021-2022 yeah. season. And that's a lots problem. of excitement. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we'll shift gears to a league that's, uh, well, not doing it quite as well. And that is Major League Baseball, which is reportedly not considering pausing the 2020 season after more than a dozen members of the Miami Marlins tested positive for COVID-19 over the weekend. The club was supposed to play the Orioles tonight, but the game was canceled while players self-isolate in Philadelphia, where they played last night. The Phillies' own scheduled game against the Yankees was also canceled while they undergo tests of their own. I'm not going to restoke uh, fires of Cabin Sports Radio episodes past where I was putting money, figurative money, because mm. I don't bet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, putting money on the fact that the MLB season was not going to happen. It was going to be scrapped altogether. Yeah. I don't think this makes that a reality. Uh, if they've put up with all of their stumbling blocks to yeah. this point through, you know, quote unquote spring training or midsummer training, I guess mm-hmm. it was. Uh, as it was, but uh, they they didn't you know didn't take a step back while all that was happening. Players testing positive <laughs> for weeks leading up to the season. Yeah. Ah, uh, as much as it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, I don't see why this would stop them either. Yeah. Wow. I. You know, I'm I'm going back to mid March now when the the NBA of course pulled the plug on their season with one positive test, and then there were a couple more that sort of followed afterwards. When right, Rudy Gobert was of course the first uh, suspended the season immediately. Yeah, now we're talking a dozen players on a single team who played a game in another city last night. So now the players of that team are being tested. Uh, we don't have bubble sites. We don't have hub cities. Uh, you know, the NBA of course is a Disney World resort. Um, there are some really funny stories already coming out of there of guys breaking uh, quarantine, breaking protocol to go to Great. strip clubs. Great uh, stuff. Lou yeah. Williams last night, of the, or recently anyways, uh, left quarantine to go to a strip club. Um, and uh, now we'll have to pay his time. Ten days quarantine, I think, uh, <laughs> and before he can rejoin his team. So I'm sure he's got a couple teammates not too thrilled with him right now. But the point being that these... These protocols are in place. These these bubbles, these um, these these host sites uh, in the NHL, of course, Toronto and Edmonton. Major League Baseball doing its own thing. We're having home games. Teams are traveling. No attendance, of course. But then yeah. you get things like this happening. I, I I mean, I never really got into the the nitty gritty of what the MLB, you know, what their their return. It sounds weird to call it a return to play because yeah. they didn't have a season that right. you know was stopped in the middle or anything. But I I never really look too much into their 
what they were doing as far as protocol uh, to, you know, keep players as safe as mm-hmm. possible. Whatever it did, whatever they did come up with, I don't know how it got approved yeah. when there was no no hub city aspect. You yeah. got players traveling from, you know, major city to major city. And now, like, not only do you potentially have, yeah, like the players themselves who have been mm-hmm. tested positive, but there's there's still a threat to to people around them like anyone who may be working in the in the facility yep. you know uh managers training staff all that sort of thing these players are obviously not staying self isolated yeah um and like you say even in the NBA where you you do have a a bubble city where all the players are supposed to be you, you're going to have at least uh, probably a handful that are going to act irresponsibly mm-hmm. just because I don't know. They just feel like they can't just stay put and play basketball yeah. or play baseball. Like the, there's there's going to be extracurricular activities, oh, yeah. and so at least with, with the the bubble plan, you are in theory minimizing that. Yes. Yeah. How did anything the MLB came up with get approved? Yeah. It and just it kind of blows my mind. We know that labor negotiations were pretty rough. Uh, there was a lot of back yeah. and forth. Uh, and then before you knew it, the season was trimmed from X amount of games to X amount of games. Now we're settling on a 60-game season. Yeah. And the Blue Jays have played three games now. So let's say teams are three, four games in. We're already canceling a minimum of three games in the first week alone. Uh, for for one club, t- two for the uh, the Marlins and one for the Phillies, and that remains to be seen if there's going to be more. We've got more than a dozen. More could end up testing positive. They obviously cannot play. They'll have to self isolate and remove themselves from the team. But then, who also over the course of the last week had they come into contact right. um, with? So I, I think there was a plan um, for, like what the NBA did, to have a, a host uh, city. And I think it was Arizona or something like that. But mm. between the Players Association and the league, they couldn't get it done. So they settled on this relatively short season. And, you know, we're already wiping out games now. Uh, what What's to say if, you know, are they, are they going to be made up later? Because what if we get in with such a short season, um, you know, we're going to have some pretty tight playoff races. Um so yeah, no, like you said, it's it's not just the players; it's the training staff, it's the the coaching staff, and these these people are are coming into contact with people who are obviously transmitting COVID nineteen. So uh, it's it's not not a great look no. uh, for the for the first week of the regular season. I think there was an owners' call today; it didn't come up, so clearly they're not too concerned about it right now. <laughs> Why would we be uh, concerned right? about um, a dozen positive yeah. cases? And then you're hearing, I think, recently the NHL said in fa- since phase three began, uh, no positive uh, cases of, of COVID nineteen. I don't believe there are any active ones in the the NBA bubble right now. So. It's it's just unfortunate. It's not a great look for for Major League Baseball right now. Um, but I mean, the ownership groups don't seem to be too bothered by it. So perhaps we'll just move on from this and uh, play will resume and we will have a shortened season. But yeah, week one we're already wiping out games of a sixty and and baseball we're playing every single day. Yeah, so that's going to go by pretty quick. We're yeah. looking at like a two month season basically. Uh, so not not the best that we're already wiping games out. It's honestly sad and kind of scary to think like what what would it take? Yeah, what would it take to look at the situation beyond this yes. right out of the gate? Twelve players te- yeah. testing positive for COVID nineteen. What is it going to take for the MLB to st- take a step back and and actually take it seriously? Yeah, if you're not going to take that seriously, <laughs> yeah. Like, what are you going to take seriously? How, you know, how, like, how are they going to play more games? Like that's that is a significant chunk. And I know, like you, you know, you're you were inquiring a little bit about you know what steps. They, I know that they they're trimming the the roster sizes, so uh, you can only have so many people report to a site at one time. Uh, masking, I think, has to be observed in both the dugout and the bullpen, and some type of of distancing. So there are some some measures in place, but oh my goodness, like the bare minimum. Yeah, yeah, seriously. But we're one weekend, and you've got a dozen or more on one team alone. Like, how are they going to field the team? Yeah. Like, assuming that that that, that group now has to self isolate, there's going to be a lot of call ups. Maybe some real bad baseball in Miami for yeah. the next little while. <laughs> Who knows? That might be a theme we yeah. see in yeah. sports for the next little while. Oh boy. 
All right, uh, we can we can move on to quarantining now, and that's the idea of quarantine quarterbacks, which is reportedly being floated around NFL circles as an insurance policy in the event of a COVID-19 outbreak. While an outbreak within any positional group would be damaging, it would be especially challenging for teams to lose multiple quarterbacks to positive diagnoses. According to one veteran agent, quarantine quarterbacks would be responsible for training and staying up to date with game plans remotely, to limit possible exposure to COVID-19. It's a smart idea in theory. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know if in practice it will work out quite as well as the theory. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, with quarterbacks, as you know, everyone knows the quarterback is is by far the most important player in the game of yeah. football. It takes a lot of coordination. you got to be on the same page as, you know, a bunch of other players. It takes timing. Your timing is absolutely crucial to mm. be a successful quarterback. And that's the one thing where, I mean, obviously this is a, this is a scenario where they're hoping it never comes to it Yeah, because you know, yeah, if you're, if your quarterback room, like in football, you know, rosters are so huge that they break them down into the quarterback room, the right. receivers room, the running backs room, the offensive line. They're all kind of, they're all part of the same team. Obviously they obviously all practice together, but they kind of train uh separately Mm -hmm. a little bit um and even more so in the nfl than say the cfl uh but so that yeah the scenario is that say one quarterback say tom brady tests positive for Mm covid19 then there's a very good chance that if you're working in you know very close quarters with the two other quarterbacks on the starting roster yeah then there's a very good chance that those two quarterbacks may have covid19 as well so then you have the quarantine quarterback, someone who's separated from the team, but is staying up to date on the playbook, you know, uh, different schemes that they're running yeah. and is training in a facility removed from the club. You, you can't, yeah, I mean, you can throw the ball, you can obviously stay in good physical shape, mm-hmm. uh, all that kind of stuff. You can know about the plays, but the timing with the players, like knowing totally. how a player runs a route which changes from player to player, yeah. little intricacies from, you know, this wide receiver to this tight end and all that. It is, it is really tough and it is, it, it takes a lot of practice with, uh, within a group to get that sort of timing down. And that's why, to your point earlier, saying we might see a lot of bad yeah. sports, this would be case in point. This is a, it's a safeguard, but it's a disaster scenario. Yeah. If you ever had to actually put this quarantine quarterback into action, you can pretty much expect they're, you know, not going to do so well. Remember the the scandal, of course, when the NFL brought in the substitute refs and how oh yeah how horribly that went. Yeah. yeah, maybe that's maybe that's the theme for the summer and even into the fall. We're going to see. Maybe it'll make us feel better about ourselves. We might see some really bad professional sports for a little bit. <laughs> I've always you kind of heard the joke, like, you know, for the Olympics, it'd be really funny for every event to just have a, a, a an non, average Joe team. Yeah, an average Joe. Yeah. Like a non-professional athlete do the exact same thing <laughs> that all these professionals are doing just to see how much higher professional athletes set the bar for us and provide a little bit more context. But, yeah, I, I same with you. I, I get it in principle. It mm. makes sense. But I think, um, and you know, more probably more than other sports, uh, you're gonna be you're gonna be spending a lot more time with your cohort, with your grouping, uh, with your position, right? Yeah. Um, and and bigger groupings for like you know the offensive line, defensive line, and those units. When you get to like you know quarterbacks and and kickers, we're not talking nearly as many guys. Right. And you're 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 in smaller groups. You're spending a lot of time together. Mm-hmm. So the risk of transmission is probably a lot higher yep. in those smaller groups. And and people, you're talking moistly, right? You're exercising, right? Um, so, yeah, the, the risk of transmission probably is significantly higher. Uh, and there's a much greater chance with a smaller unit that you could potentially wipe out one whole unit with um, with positive um, diagnoses. So I get it. The, the concern is real. Um but I, to your point about timing, I think that's absolutely everything. It, it, you'd have to sort of use the honor system. Uh, you'd have to really bank on people maintaining their their physical health, making sure that they're taking care of themselves on that side of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, the game planning side of things, making sure that you're you're up to date with all the play calls and everything. But you can't. There's you can't 
undervalue the importance of of practicing with your actual teammates and, yeah. and the connection you'd have with your wide receiver core. You can't do that just by no. by practicing on your own. Um, so, like we said, it's an insurance policy. Hopefully, this yeah. is a, a last ditch effort. Uh, and we don't have to see it, um, but understand why the idea is currently being tossed around because it, it's plausible. It could could very well happen, uh, but let's not hope it gets to that point. I mean, just to put it into context, for example's sake, like think of how many times in the past you've watched a football game where the starting quarterback goes down, you know, with whatever injury. Mm. The second stringer comes in and looks like he's never played a down of right. football in his yeah. life because yeah. the timing is all off, totally. and that that that's someone who is training directly under the quarterback. You're still kind of uh, running the plays with the practice squad, but that's just the difference in timing. That practice squad is entirely different from the starting offense. And so a lot of times, yeah, in that scenario, you see this guy come in who's generally a top-notch athlete, you know, can throw the ball just as hard as the starting quarterback, knows all the plays, knows the playbook inside and out like the starting quarterback. Mm Mm-hmm. But the timing is not there, and when that happens in a in a professional atmosphere at that speed, they just look like complete goofs yeah, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so you take someone who's not even you know potentially not even in the same city and try and just throw them in there. Yeah, You're like well, good luck. You're all we got. <laughs> Get out there. <laughs> you remember the uh, the old TV show? I think it was on Spike TV. Pros versus yes. Joes. Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have a feeling in 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 a certain scenario we might see more like Joes versus. Joes. Yeah, there's a point in my life where I thought I could maybe actually maybe hang with the the pros in some of the events. I think but then you I could just, have. Get, just yeah. get absolutely crushed. Well, maybe. because they were always, you know, retired, right? Like they yes. weren't they weren't right in the in the prime of their career. They yeah. were usually kind of. They'll still talk some trash, but they're, you know, older. Yeah. Maybe not quite in the same physical shape they were back in the day. <laughs> and I do remember a couple of times, like, I, I might might have a chance. Like, well, it's Magic so. Johnson. I mean, he yeah. can't run anymore, yeah, it's but, like, like, he's still going to hit every shot he yeah, takes. Yeah. <laughs> You're not what you were. No. No, exactly. Uh, yeah, so it'll it'll be interesting. <clears throat> uh, and just on, on the heels of the NFL there, uh, you know, we still have not, not heard a ton of concrete stuff about the CFL and what's mm-hmm. happening with the 2020 season. They're trying to make it happen. Uh, the, the the most recent thing we've heard is that the CFL tabled a six-game uh, return-to-play contract proposal to the Players Association. I can't... I don't know if I heard that it was rejected or not, per se, but mm. there is... There have been reports, uh, Farhan Lalji of TSN... Uh, saying that there is growing optimism, this is directly from his Twitter, growing optimism that the CFL and Players Association are closing in on an amended collective bargaining agreement. Football operations staff are being informed and beginning to prepare for a possible 2020 season. Hmm. This is from one team's internal communications. Quote, September 14th, players will begin traveling to Winnipeg, which has been named the, the one hub city for the entire league. You will have to pass a COVID test twice over a six-day period to be allowed into the bubble, so similar to the NHL's uh, travel uh, restrictions, which is going on right now, that testing. Uh, After the six-day quarantine in Winnipeg, training camp will start. Hmm. So, a lot has to be done still by that point. September 14th, they've got some time, obviously, between now and then. A lot still has to be figured out. Uh, So, it's still, I don't know. It's still very much hanging in the balance, but it is nice to hear that there are wheels turning kind of quietly behind the scenes. Obviously, uh, team staff and players and personnel kind of have to be prepared in the event that something does happen. Yeah, I think there's still kind of a 50-50 shot that this season doesn't happen, Mm -hmm. but I mean, they obviously got to, you know, kind of cross their fingers and hope for the best. Yeah. At the very least, it's encouraging because I, I think right around the time of uh, when when seasons were suspended, there was optimism. I think in really every single major sports league that yeah. we're going to resume this season, we're going to award a winner this year. If we're uh, starting a season late or picking one up where we left off, uh, the plan is to carry on and yeah. award a winner this year. The CFL was the one exception. There was uh, the financial picture wasn't clear. Yeah. There was a lot of sort of doom and gloom. 
uh, with regards to their books. And and I think right away the commissioner said there's there's a very real chance we don't have a season this year. Yeah. Um, so pretty encouraging. We would typically have kicked off a couple weeks ago. It's usually around Canada Day. Usually around the Canada yeah. Day long weekend. Yeah. yeah, that's when the regular season uh, kicks off. Mm. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see if that happens. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not I'm not holding my breath. No, no. No, but uh Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Anyway, we're going to take a break and uh we'll be back and uh take a little uh trip into the NHL playoffs. The play-in playoff format uh kicks off this weekend. The Cabin Sports Radio podcast brought to you by Sport North, moving sport forward. Cabin Sports Radio, always brought to you by Sport North, moving sport forward. As you heard last week on the show, the 68th annual Peterson and OJ Golf Tournament is happening next month here in Yellowknife at the Yellowknife Golf Club. It is a fantastic event and very happy that Sport North has figured out a way to make it happen again this year, despite the COVID era. Uh, Obviously, raising funds for Kids Sport NWT, which is a very worthy cause and 68 years, man, like what a tradition that golf tournament has become. Again, that is happening in August. And if you would like to enter a team or you would like to sponsor a hole or figure out how you can be involved, you can contact Dakota Earl, who is coordinating the tournament at 669-8326. Or you can email Dakota at D Earl, that's D-E-A-R-L-E, at sportnorth.com. Um, okay, so the NHL play-in slash playoffs start this Saturday, August 1st. Uh, we've got a couple series. The best of five series is how it's going to start in case you haven't been paying attention. Uh, and it's pretty interesting, some of the matchups we got here. One of the most intriguing ones to me is the Montreal Canadiens at Pittsburgh Penguins. Mm. I could see that series being an upset for the Penguins. Really? I don't necessarily want to be the Montreal Canadiens going into this, Mm -hmm. but you've got Carey Price, who's fresh, which is, you know, come regular playoff time in the NHL, it's always a question when the Montreal Canadiens are part of the NHL playoffs, what Carey Price's health is going to be, and if he can carry them through the playoffs, which generally it's it's understood that that's what it's going to take for the Montreal Canadiens. And he's a hundred percent. So uh, I and Sidney Crosby is not necessarily a hundred percent there. I did see a report er- earlier today that he could be ready to go for their first game, uh, but who knows? And who knows if he's just injured? Yeah, I'm so I don't know if you saw me smirking there. Um, I don't know if you saw footage from a, a Canadian's practice the other day when Shea Weber absolutely oh my beamed. God someone yeah it was one of their their backup goaltenders I yeah. if it was Carey price we'd be hearing a whole lot more about it there probably would have been fights breaking out put it through his mask oh he yeah hardest shot in the league probably uh and wasn't able to keep it down he got it up high you know and the scariest thing about that clip is it looks like he barely leaned into yeah. that shot oh yeah and it was <laughs> completely unobstructed top of the circle and he just clapped one oh. um and it was high he, he wasn't able to keep it down uh, so Shea Weber looks pretty good, I guess. Tip top condition. So yeah, that's where I was going with that. But no, you're you're exactly right, and I think that's why some of the executives weren't crazy about this idea because Montreal's sliding in literally as the last seed in mm-hmm. the Eastern Conference, the the twelfth seed um, out of the the twenty four team format um, in the Eastern Conference, uh, and they get matched up with with the Penguins. And uh, we heard Carey Price's name, Patrick Kane, um, Connor McDavid. These aren't people you want to be matched up with yeah. in a shortened series where every game is just that much more important. You don't have that that leeway of a of a best of uh, seven. Now we're talking take away two games. So yeah. can he? He's the kind of guy that could steal three games for you if he outplays Matt Murray on on three nights. That could be it. Um, and yeah, now just with the extended period of time of, of of clubs being able to get healthy, they're coming in with a fresh slate. They could uh, they could make some noise. So if you go to NHL.com, click on news, they've got the full uh, full series rundown, rather day-by-day rundown of uh, right from Saturday, August 1st, what games are happening then in the East and in the West, and runs right through the, uh, the round-robin best-of-five series. So 
Saturday, August 1st, you've got the New York Rangers versus the Carolina Hurricanes, Game 1, Florida Panthers, New York Islanders, Game 1, and Montreal Canadiens versus Pittsburgh Penguins, Game 1. And in the Western Conference, the Chicago Blackhawks versus the Edmonton Oilers, and Winnipeg Jets versus the Calgary Flames. Ooh. I'm looking forward to both of those yes. series. Man, that'll be some some fun hockey to watch. Like you just mentioned, Patrick Kane. Yeah, Patrick Kane, Jonathan Taves versus Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid. Yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Very, very good. An all-Canadian matchup in the other one. Not not the most heated of, of rivals, you know, in different divisions. You got the Jets in the Central, the uh, the Flames in the uh, Pacific. But uh, we were talking last week about when the NHL announced uh, the awards finalists. So uh, Connor Hellbuck yep. um, playing really good hockey at the time of the break. Uh, even with the sort of shortcomings and shortfalls they have in the on the defensive um, side of things this year, I'm just going to say it: 2020 Vezina Trophy winner. Yeah, regardless totally. of whether they call yeah. him it or not. No, he had a he had a fantastic season. I would consider him the front runner as well. It's just a good story. Um, yeah, um, we all know how the Flames went out last year. They're probably looking for a little vengeance. They yeah. of course made some some deals in the off season and throughout the course of the season to adjust uh, to sort of. Uh, fix those issues, uh, depth, but more so just grit factor issues. Um, they ran into a, a team that just steamrolled them last year, Colorado. They they yeah. they were able to bump them off their game. They got physical with them, and and that was it. That was all she wrote. And they were out in the in the first round, in what many people considered an upset. Um, and then yeah, of course, with the uh, the other series, um, you got a healthy Connor McDavid, a healthy Leon Drysettle. Both had some significant time off now. Um, Art Ross winner, Ted Lindsay winner, Hart Trophy winner in uh, Leon Drysaddle. He was the best player in the league this year, uh, and he's playing with the best player in hockey in, in Connor McDavid, widely assumed. Um, but you run into that's a that's that's not a great first round matchup. Yeah, with the with the Chicago a team that has just uh, championship pedigree to the nines yeah. like that it, as much as you could ask for. Um, it's in their DNA between between Jonathan Taves at the captain position, uh, Patrick Kane, who can do absolutely anything, still at a high level, even though he's um, a little bit older now. They are just as dangerous as they 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 were in years past. So yeah, that could be a tough one. The, honestly, a lot of really fun first round matchups yeah. like in in both conferences, and and some of them really, especially with the the best of five versus the best of seven. Could really be a coin toss, some of them. Yeah, and with the Blackhawks Oilers series, like you say, you know, you got you got the explosive offense of Connor McDavid, mm. Leon Dreisaitl, a lot of youth, young legs with the Oilers that are going to be, you know, ready to go. But like you said, the Blackhawks, you, you cannot sleep on them. They've no. got experience beyond experience, and yeah. same thing as was what we were talking about with Carey Price. The thought would be at this time of year, normally in the NHL playoffs, if they were in a spot, the thought would be, how healthy are they? Yeah. With the Chicago Blackhawks, you go through a whole 82-game season, you're thinking, okay, well, this roster is, you know, a bit long in the tooth. They're yeah. probably a bit worn down by this point. Not the case. So that will be uh, really interesting to watch. One thing I just thought of as we were talking about the Winnipeg Jets-Calgary Flames series, I forgot that Travis Hamanick had opted out for the uh, for the return to play, that's right. For the NHL yeah. playoffs, so that's a, a huge blow to the Calgary Flames right. defense core. I, do, I I took a quick look at, to see if there was any update from there because that happened in like early to mid July. He made that announcement, yeah. I, and I don't remember hearing if he had you know changed his mind or anything like right. that. So I don't imagine he has because I would have thought that would be equally as big news mm-hmm. if he decided, yeah, and you know what, I'm actually going to come back and play. Uh, so as far as I know, uh, yeah, the Calgary Flames will be without one of their top defensive defensemen yeah. in Travis Hamonick. So there's a, a, a big advantage to the Winnipeg Jets there in that series. Uh, the following day, Sunday, August 2nd, in the Eastern Conference, you've got the Philadelphia Flyers and Boston Bruins and the Columbus Blue Jackets versus the Toronto Maple Leafs. Very interesting two series there. Mm. Uh, the Bruins got some very good news as David Pasternak was cleared to practice uh, just the other day, so he's back on the ice training with them. Not sure about the status of, what was it, like five or six other players yeah. or something like that that were deemed unfit, unfit to, to play. play. Yeah. Yes. So I'm not, yeah, same, not quite sure if there's, I'm sure there are by now, uh, I mean, 
couple days, well, a few days away now. I'm sure most uh, most players have now reported to the the two hub cities. I I don't know. Maybe I'm being ignorant saying this, but you know, a team like Boston, Father Time, not on their side. You know, they're yeah. they're an older team for sure. But how do you rule them out? Yeah, um, you can't. And then they've, you know, there might be some issues with and with this latest schedule. It's a, it's a little unforgiving, you know, with the shortened series. Uh, at least they'll get the um, the top four seeds in each conference. Will get. I mean, they don't lose anything if they if they don't make it. But uh, between the top four teams in each conference, they'll they'll duke it out for seeding, and then we'll sort of reshuffle the deck. And then it's those other four matchups in each um, conference. Uh, where, yeah, I mean, you lose three games, you're out. Right. Pack your bags, you're done. Yeah. Um, you know, so maybe a little bit more breathing room, room for error for the top four teams. You could just lose a, a spot in the in the standings a little bit and get maybe a tougher draw for the second round. But obviously they had a better regular season. They deserve to be up there. Yeah. Um, uh, so there might be some continuity issues, like you said, with uh, some of the players not reporting to training camp earlier. Um, and, you know, you know, the Zidane Ochara is getting older. Patrice Bergeron is getting older. They've got some other guys where Father Time not not quite on their side anymore. But you can't ruin you can't rule this team out at no. all. You know, within one game of winning the the Stanley Cup last year, they're perennial contenders. They're always a force in the Atlantic. They're a tough physical team, and they match up well with pretty much anyone because they can do it on both sides of the ice. Uh, obviously, they got the perfection line and got outstanding goaltending between. Another Vesna candidate, uh, Tuka yep. Rask, who shares the crease with uh, Yaroslav Halak. So uh, they check every single box for me as far as contenders go. They're at the top of the list. Um, and despite you know some of those shortfalls, y- you can never rule them out. So they'll they'll be a force regardless. Yeah. Plus, at the very least, they just got forty eight goals back onto the roster with David. Pastor. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. So they're about as dangerous as ever. Yeah. Uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets versus Toronto Maple Leafs. I have no idea what to expect out of this series. Um, you know, well, one thing we've been talking about, sort of in, in terms of predictions, is that we're going to see scrambly hockey. Yeah, it's going to be kind of like you know opening night of the regular season, where it's it's kind of a gong show. You you know that's where you tend to see seven to six finals oh, yeah. and that sort oh, yeah. of thing. If the Leafs can come out of the gate and just overwhelm the Blue Jackets with offense, yeah. I like their chances. If they come out, you know, a bit lazy, a bit slow, and the Blue Jackets can kind of lull them to sleep and then just put the defensive clinch on, mm-hmm. then I don't like their odds. So it, I I think that I think the Maple Leafs kind of will be they will kind of determine their own fate. Absolutely. In this in this uh, you know, not to take anything away from the Columbus Blue Jackets, yeah. but we all know the explosive potential that the, the Toronto Maple Leafs offense does have. Can their defense be good enough right. to support that? As anyone's guess. And what are you going to get from from Frederick Anderson, who had a down year, I think his worst year uh, from a save percentage standpoint, like right around 9-10, 9-09, I think. So not, not the best season from him. Um, and we know the story about uh, support um, for him uh, with the Leafs getting almost no points for... Yeah. The whole first stretch of the season from a backup goaltender. Uh, address that with the Jack Campbell trade, but he again didn't get too much uh, too much ice time. And he's not their guy. No, no. Frederick Anderson yeah. carried a lot of the load. I don't know if you saw, but Sheldon Keefe was experimenting with um, a death lineup uh, where he had a top line of Matthews, Tavares, and Marner. Uh, oh, wow. he was yeah. The, the, so that was rolled out during uh, one of the practices. Uh, they of course get ice time together during um, um, power plays, yeah. Uh, but this was uh, in in regular practice, so who knows? Maybe hmm. that's a card that he plays at some point. Uh, but you're right; it's uh, for me I, the X factor is is Anderson. What are you going to get in the crease? Uh, Columbus is a really good team. They yeah. they're healthy now. They had a lot of uh, health issues earlier in the season. They're a defensively minded team, a tough team that can roll out four lines. Um, and they've got a Jack Adams uh, trophy yes, um, sir. finalist in uh, John Tortorella. The always entertaining John Torts. Oh, um, at the very least, he will yeah. keep things entertaining. Yeah. So that's <laughs> another coin flip, honestly. Um, you know, a lot of these series, too, the Rangers and, and the Hurricanes, that's another one that could honestly go either way. The yeah. Rangers were playing really good hockey before the break. Uh, Panera and Zibanejad had great seasons. Um, you know, we touched on the, the the Canadians and the Penguins in the five twelve, and then on the other side in the West in the five twelve, it's 
the Edmonton uh, Oilers against the Blackhawks. So tough draw for both teams, really, in the five position because I don't know if I'd want to play either of those teams. They, we could see some some fun upsets, and I think with the uh, um, margin of error just that much smaller, we could be in for some surprises. And rounding out that uh, the Sunday in the Western Conference, you've got a best-of-five series between the Arizona Coyotes and Nashville Predators. I think we'd probably all bet on the Predators, yeah. but I don't know. The the Coyotes have a lot of, uh, they got a lot of speed. They'll yeah. probably surprise a few teams. Um, well, I mean, I don't know if they'll, they'll necessarily surprise everyone because everyone knows what everyone else has got going right, on. Everyone's right. healthy. Um, a lot on the line for Taylor Hall, though, as a yeah. pending, pending UFA. He, yeah. he, he it would do him a service if he had a really good playoff run. Plus, he got Phil Kessel, the all oh, yeah. entertaining oh, yeah. Phil they Kessel. Can, they can fill the nets. They can, yeah. So that'll be an interesting series. No uh, no real inkling as to where that'll go. Mm. Uh, Pecorine traditionally, at some point, kind of peters out in the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll see if that happens again or not. Uh, you got a round robin series between the St. Louis Blues and Colorado Avalanche. I think that's going to be a ton of fun. That'll to be watch. a lot of fun. Uh, and then the best of five series between the Minnesota Wild and the Vancouver Canucks. Yes, I think that'll play out maybe similarly to the Toronto Maple Leafs Columbus yeah. Blue Jackets series, yeah. where yeah, you've got a lot of speed and a lot of skill, and uh, you know a ton of offensive potential with the Vancouver Canucks versus the Minnesota Wild, who are going to get by on sandpaper grit yeah. type hockey yeah. that's that's the way they succeed and uh and, and that'll be another kind of you know veteran presence versus youthful exuberance mm-hmm. type storyline absolutely so that'll be a fun one to watch uh i'm looking forward to it i don't know about you mike i'm thinking i might have to up my internet package yeah. and uh maybe get some uh streaming service for the nhl playoffs because right. it's uh it's going to be fun to watch, like I say, not necessarily good hockey, right. but it's going to be entertaining. Oh, yeah. I think my cable will finally get some love after a couple months off. Uh, it'll be great. Basketball resuming on Thursday, hockey on Saturday. Uh, really quickly, if I were to pick, I, I like the Blues. I like the Avs. Okay. Um, I like the Golden Knights. If I'm throwing in one of the bottom eight, I, I would love to see the Oilers have a deep run. Yeah. Like, Why it, not? At least second round. Uh, in the East, obviously the Bruins. Uh, it'd be nice if if Steven Stamkos, you know, finally got that elusive cup uh, with the Lightning. I like the Flyers. I don't know why. I like the Flyers. And if I'm throwing in one of the bottom eight, I'm going to throw in, you know what? I'm going to throw in the Columbus Blue Jackets. I like it. Yeah. yeah. If not, maybe the, the Hurricanes, who, who of course, had a deep run last year. Yeah. So either way, it's going to be fun. It, you, like you said, it's going to be sloppy. It might be a little uncoordinated. It might be a little ugly, but it's going to be really fun. I'm not going to make bets, Mike, because okay. that, that's a fool's game. That's what we do on the show, <laughs> and then we we listen to it afterwards. That's true. Yeah, we okay. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a knee. Okay, on that. All one. right, gonna run out the clock on predictions okay. because I I wanted to do a little bit of a deep dive on the history of hockey in Seattle. Of Very course, good. we opened the show talking about the announcement last week where the Seattle Kraken mm-hmm. was announced as the newest uh, club in the NHL. Uh, and I don't know if you saw, but the mayor of Seattle, uh, you know, obviously a lot of excitement there. And when he announced that the team name was what it was, he unveiled it and said something about bringing the Stanley Cup back to Seattle, mm. which I think probably raised a few eyebrows. It was for me, for sure. Yeah. I, I'm sure a lot of people didn't know that Seattle had ever had an NHL team. And that's because Seattle has not had an NHL team okay. previously, but they did win a Stanley Cup. Now, I went to... This piqued my interest, so yeah. I had to go down a little bit of You went deep into the archives. Went deep into the archives. Let me take you back to 1915. Wow. It was a year... 105 of, years ago. <laughs> 105 years ago. It was a time of upheaval between the Pacific Coast Hockey League and the National Hockey Association, Ooh. which were rival leagues, a war between the league exploded the leagues rather exploded in 1915 when Frank and Lester Patrick yes that Lester Patrick who founded the Pacific Coast Hockey Association started poaching players Ooh. from the National Hockey Association now in this time 
The Pacific Coast Hockey Association at this time was actually considered to be the stronger league okay. than the National Hockey Association. The National Hockey Association would kind of eventually evolve to become the NHL in kind of a funny way because there were seven clubs at the time, and one of those clubs was the Toronto Blue Shirts. Whoa. The owner of the Toronto Blue Shirts' name was Eddie Livingston, and the owners of the other clubs decided they didn't really like Eddie Livingston. Okay. <laughs> so they just decided to halt the National Hockey Association and uh, start a new league called the National Hockey League. Wow. They did what that. What a slap in the face. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Boxed out Livingston in the blue shirts and established the Toronto Arenas after that. And thus, the uh, franchise, which would eventually become the Toronto Maple Leafs, mm. was born basically out of spite of the previous Toronto okay. professional hockey organization. So, but let's go over to the Pacific Coast. The Seattle Metropolitans mm. were owned by Frank and Lester Lester Patrick and uh yeah, they assembled quite a team in the demise of the NHA and Seattle won the Stanley Cup by defeating the National Hockey Association's Montreal Canadiens. Wow. Three games to one by a combined score of 23 to 11. The heavily favored Canadians trounced the Metropolitans in game one despite only arriving in Seattle that morning. The Mets would storm back to win games two, three, and four, outscoring Montreal 19 to three. Wow. 14 of Seattle's goals were scored by the legend Bernie Morris, including six in Game 4 alone. Wow. Games 1 and 3 were played by PCHA Rules, which was seven players per side, forward passing in the neutral zone. That's right. The National Hockey Association at the time did not allow forward passing oh in the goodness. neutral zone and no substitution for penalized players. Games two and four were played under NHA rules, which was six players per side, no forward passing, and substitutions allowed. After winning the 1917 Stanley Cup, the Metropolitans also played in the Stanley Cup Finals in 1919, which, if that sounds familiar, it's because that was the Stanley Cup that was never awarded That's right. because of the previous global pandemic. Yes, yes. the Spanish flu. The Spanish flu. Yes. After five games with the series tied 2-2-1, two, two, somehow there was a tie. Okay. Uh, <laughs> wow. And they also made the finals in 1920 when they lost to the Ottawa Senators. Oh, my goodness. Now, I really enjoyed reading about this, uh, the, the 1919 playoffs. The day the 1919 playoffs began, star center Bernie Morris was arrested and jailed at Fort Lewis for draft evasion, despite the fact that he was a Canadian citizen. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Without their best scorer, the Mets still annihilated the Vancouver Millionaires. There's your automatic rivalry yeah, yeah. spanning back 105 years. Just, It's going to get stoked again, rekindled, if you will. In the PCA <laughs> Championship Series and jumped out to a 2-1 lead through Game 3 of the Stanley Cup Final, outscoring Montreal 16-6 to as Seattle's best player, Frank Foyston, scored eight goals. <laughs> Game 4 of the 1919 Stanley Cup Final, get this, is regarded as perhaps the greatest game ever played. Wow. Resulting in a scoreless tie after two overtime oh periods. Oh my goodness. So With, they did that is that the, this is the one they chalked up to a tie. The, or No. Okay, no. Actually, that was, wait, hold on. Hold on. Okay. The plot thickens. Wow. It just scoreless, blows my mind that there's a tie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Scoreless tie in regulation. First overtime, yeah. second overtime, players collapsed on the ice from exhaustion <laughs> at the final whistle. Oh my goodness! Or possibly because of Spanish flu. Yeah, the Metropolitans naturally. C Cully Wilson, Cully, <laughs> netted the <laughs> the lone puck on the night, only to have it waved off by referee Mickey Ian, who decided time had expired a Mickey. split second before the goal. Wow. 
The Mets jumped out to a 4-1 lead. So that was the tie game. Yes, you're right. Apparently, you could only play two overtimes. Okay. And then everyone had to go to work yeah. the next day. So, you know, yeah. let's or be reasonable. Or die of exhaustion. Or die yeah. of exhaustion. Just, just scrape them up off the ice. The Mets Carry on. jumped out to a 4-1 lead in the third period of Game 5 before exhaustion consumed the shorthanded Mets. They had a player out with a broken skate. They had a player arrested from draft yeah. dodging. Wow. Bone Mo- Spurs. <laughs> Montreal scored three goals in the final period to tie the game and force a second consecutive overtime match. How? Yeah. How are they going to live through this? With Frank Foyston injured in the period and Jack Walker, there it is, out with a broken skate, Cully Wilson, the hero, or the near hero in the previous game, collapsed on the ice as the Canadians scored the game winner to send the series to an unprecedented sixth game. So literally, there were just no Metropolitan players left on the ice. Yeah. Cully was dead, you know, <laughs> just lying there. Yeah. And they, they put the game, in, put the puck into the open net. Uh, the next morning, the Spanish flu pandemic ravaged the globe, struck the two teams, ultimately killing Montreal's Joe Hall. Oh, my God. And hospitalizing four other Canadians. Without the ability to field a team, Montreal offered to forfeit the cup though the offer was declined by Frank Patrick and Pete Muldoon, who felt championships should be won on the ice. Wow. Man, this team nice. has an incredible history yeah. already. So when did they when did they fold? Like when was the last time we saw an iteration of a Seattle hockey franchise? The Seattle Metropolitans lasted until 1924. Wow. And that was when the Pacific Coast Hockey Association, the entire league, folded. Huh. Basically because the NHL had really kind of come into its own. It found its footing at that point, and they just couldn't compete money-wise. So Lester and Frank Patrick just jumped ship, moved over to the NHL, uh, managed the uh, the New York Rangers, I believe, and uh, and the rest is history. Wow. But man, what a a legendary history the Seattle Hockey Club will have, huh? They seem to be tied to global pandemics, unfortunately, <laughs> but there is a rich history there. There is a rich history I always there. love those old-time hockey stories. They're, you oh. can't make them up. No, you really can't. And you know that like this was day-to-day life for them. Yeah. Get thrown in the tank, play a game that night, <laughs> go to work the next day. Get arrested play with no draft pads. dodging. Yeah. Yeah, jump out of the ice for game five. Par for the course. Oh, uh, man, I'm looking forward to the crack. And if they can be half that entertaining. Right? Yeah. Oh, man, we are in for some great hockey in the future in the NHL. All right. In more celebration of our new NHL franchise, the Seattle Kraken thought we would play out a little bit of a moment of zen to end the show. We will talk to you again, not next week, because it is August long weekend. Mm. Enjoy your Monday off. And we will talk to you again the Monday after that. Talk to you then. We hope today is proof positive, proof positive that we continue to honor that passion, a passion to build the next great franchise, a passion to bring the Stanley Cup back to Seattle. We asked some people here downtown, and they sure think that new name is something. I think it sounds more silly than aggressive, but funny at the same time. So I think for like nerdy, talky people, this would be cool. It looks good. Um, Color's amazing. It looks like it could be a killer team. Kraken. Why Kraken, though? I'm not a huge fan of the the logo. I think it's a good name. Yeah. It's a mythological character, right? Here comes the Kraken, or release the Kraken. There's probably potential, potential for uh, uh, some healthy rivalry. Well, crack it's like crack, so it doesn't sound uh, that lovely. No, Kraken is not like crack.